My Christian faith plays a role in everything that I do. I mean, I always ask God to, to lead me in the right direction and let me be who I am uh, for His name. So it has a role in everything that I do, and obviously it will be on the huge stage in the Super Bowl that He's given me, and I want to make sure I'm glorifying Him while I do it. My favorite scripture, John 13, 7, you may not know now, but later you understand. Uh, just, just reminds me to keep, uh, continue to be patient, continue to, to remain diligent, steadfast, keep going. Keep your eyes on me and keep God at the center, regardless of what the circumstance is. Man, this is fun. This feels like probably what the players are going to feel like when they walk out to a crowded stadium. Guys, I was laying in bed last night. I could not sleep. And all I could I was just giggling at what would be the worst sermons that I could give today. Like, what would be the worst? Right? So some of the husbands were like, ah, babe, do we have to go to church today? And then you come in here and I give this sermon. That's what I was, I was la my, my wife's like, what are you laughing at? I'm like, the worst sermons I could give. Like, imagine you came in right now. And I was like, guys, this morning, we're going to talk about a Proverbs 31 woman. Just a glorified woman's Bible study. Everybody with overgrown jerseys. Men are like, hmm. Right? Or how about the, the, this? This one really was fun. I, this morning, a guy told me that the average person eats 11,000 calories today. America, right? So, uh, 11, I know some of you were like, some of you just cancel your Super Bowl plans. You're like, I'm not coming. I'm eating carrots, right? So, 11,000, that's five and a half days. So, what if I did a sermon on your body is a temple today? Your body's a temple. Because you're going to care at 3.30 when you're elbow deep in nacho dip, right? You're like, I'm so convicted, right? So there's just, there's so many sermons. Idolatry. See, the guys are not. So there's a couple guys that are not laughing right now. They have six fantasy teams, and they do not think that's funny. Hey, as we continue this series called Relationship, um, we have the students with us because we want to talk about the next generation. And the, this has been a three-week series, and it's really talking about relationships in a shifting culture. And so we talked about boundaries in relationships and just try to give some practical wisdom. A couple weeks ago, last week, Kevin uh, brought a message on marriage. And I, my opening verse today is, is on marriage, so it kind of transitions. But today is not about marriage. It's about preparing the next generation. And here, here's what I know. We know that the students, students, where are you guys at today? Come on. L hold on for a second. Wait, let's just have a moment, okay? You guys with me? Y'all are the loudest human beings on planet Earth. And then you get a nod in church and you're like, woo, woo, woo. All right, you ready? If, if you screw this up, your parents are going to make fun of you. Is there anything worse in the whole world than that? You ready? Ready? And in church today, we have our students. I'm going to be honest. That was like a B minus. So, um, okay. So, you, you guys, see, now I got them all hyped up. Now, now I got 25 minutes where I got to keep them at bay. You guys... You guys have a role in today's message, all right? Put your thumbs up. Good. All right. Now, parents, you have a parent. You have kids in the home right now. Raise your hand. Raise your hand right now. You obviously have a role in today's message. If you do not have kids in the house, uh, you guys can head on out. Super Bowl Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. You, that's, that's how you feel when you hear a message, huh, about not your stage of life, don't you? You're like, married? I'm not married. I want to be, but I'm not. So I'm leaving. Last week, some of you felt like that. I mean, this message is for every single person in the room because, because you have an opinion about the next generation. Get off my lawn, right? <laughs> you do. You have an opinion. And maybe it's positive. Maybe it's negative. I don't know. Uh, but you have an opinion. But I, I would say more than opinion because opinions don't change anything. You have a role. Your role may be different, right? You may play uncle, uncle, aunt, pastor, coach, 
teacher, awkward stranger passing by them, right? You have a role. And I believe with all of my heart in the next generation. I've, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, middle schoolers for 10 years. Uh, just last week, and the reason I wasn't with you guys was because I was at a camp where high schoolers were coming to faith in Christ, uh, where high schoolers were worshiping Jesus, where high schools were trying to wrestle with, with the reality of their new world, the shifting culture. And I want to tell you that if you're in the room today, you have a role in the next generation. I'm going to start off with a uh, uh, verse on marriage, part in transition from last week, but also part because, <coughs> excuse me, this verse really does shape what we're trying to raise. Let me, let me just read it for you. Genesis chapter 2 says this, this, that, says that, not this, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. They become one flesh. Okay, this is an anchor verse of raising the next generation. Even, here's why, here's why. Because you are raising, if you have kids in the home, you're raising a future husband and future wife. And how many of you know that a healthy marriage is the backbone of a family, right? And families are the backbone of a society. And you may be like, well, what if they don't, what if little Billy doesn't meet anyone? Here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. Healthy relationships are the key to any healthy society, right? So even if you're raising somebody that doesn't end up meeting somebody else, I would say that what we need in healthy relationships is a level of selflessness. Healthy relationships require that you and I, you and I lay down parts of ourself in order to have a healthy relationship. Listen, you know one of the worst friends Selfish ones that criticize you when you never reach out, and yet when you look at the text thread, it seems to be large bubbles for you and no response from them. And then the minute they send you a text and you don't respond, they're like, you don't even care. It's like, dude, you never respond. You go ghost, you ghost dark 30 for like three months, right? Th those are not great friends. Don't, don't they bug you? And, and what, what, what is killing marriage is, is selfishness, uh, selfishness. It's when you get one sinful human and you get another sinful human. You're like, hey, guys, move in together. Be like, ha, ha, see how that works out. And so, so today is about raising the next generation to teach them how to be selfless, responsible, empathetic, caring, God-fearing, secure, right? All of these things that make up a healthy human being. So we're going to talk about that. All of it. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. Raising caring, wise, and responsible humans is our responsibility to the next generation. Raising caring, wise, and responsible humans is our responsible, uh, responsibility to the next generation. If you would agree, say amen. amen. Listen to what Philippians says about this. Paul is writing. We're going to be all over scripture. So if you like that game, remember when you were a kid and uh, it was a sword drill? Remember this? If you grew up in church, if you didn't, you didn't miss much. This game's terrible. Um, they would say a verse, and all the kids would race to that verse. And if you didn't know your Bible, you felt it was a terrible game because the kids that didn't know their Bible, they were like, their parents brought them for the first time. They're like, I don't even, what, what is this? Like, who's Malachi, right? And, and then, like, the, 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 the pastor's kid, although my kids probably wouldn't be good as a kid. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> They'll get there. Boom. Raise their hand. Well, we're going to be doing that today. So if you were good at the sword drill, you're going to kill it today. If not, you'll, you'll enjoy the Super Bowl. So listen, Philippians says this. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Students, look, let me read that again. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Don't worry, parents. Don't worry. Parents, look at me. Look at me. Here. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Do you know Paul did not write that in 2023? But that, that does sure feel, feel applicable right about now. That hey, how do we stand out? 
how do we look different? How do we raise the next generation to be stars in a dark sky? What does that look like? You have a role. You have a role. We all play a role in this. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. My friends, raising caring, wise, and responsible human humans is our responsibility to the next generation. I gave you a series of verses there. Colossians 3, Philippians 2, Galatians 6, all talking about how hard work dedicated to the Lord is a representation to the rest of the world on who you are and who you represent. One of the worst witnesses we can have in the world is to love God and not be able to handle responsibility. It's to be able to love God and not be empathetic towards people. It's not enough just to be a hard worker. We also want to care about one another, don't we? So we want both. We want you guys to be hardworking adults, young adults, just a couple years away. And here, here's, here's what I want you to know. You, we got 18 years, 0 to 18, right? And there's a critical moment in time Right, where we want to make sure that we send you off in the best way possible. And here's what we know. We know that we can say things, but we also know that we, when we behave a certain way, it doesn't line up with that. That causes a lot of confusion in your head. So we, want, we don't all just want to teach you that. We want to become that. And yet also be vulnerable along the way, knowing that we're not going to be perfect. Amen? A couple things. Our parents, our parenting can be an example our discipline can be a light. Our diligent can be a witness. The question today is how are we preparing the next generation? I want to have a moment today, this morning, uh, first with the parents. First with the parents and then students. You and I will have a moment. Um, number, if you're taking notes, number four on your note sheet is this. Real simple, real simple. Pray for them and believe in them. Pray for them and believe in them. How many of you are honest? You have some fears. You have some doubts. You have some questions. It's hard for you to wrap around the world that's shifting so rapidly. And if you're honest, you're fearful, you're fearful for them, but you're also fearful of the world around them, right? It's, bo it's both, huh? And even sometimes you don't even know how to wrap your head around all of that. And I would just say, I would just say the worst thing we can do is to stop praying for them and to stop believing in them. Remember, Jesus died on the cross when you were his enemy. He believed in you. He pursued you. He came after you. And I know it's easy, and I know it's easy in that fear and in our confusion in a world that's shifting to, to write off kids that are growing up differently than me. And I'm telling you, it's the worst thing you can do. It's the worst thing you can do is to stop praying for them. It's the worst thing you can do to stop believing in them. Listen to what Paul, or, or, yeah, Paul will write to a young Timothy. Listen to this. Charging a young pastor, charging a young leader. I am here today as a pastor because a 74-year-old guy who had been married for 50 years who had, who had been in ministry for 50 years, saw something in me, loved me before I even saw anything in myself and before I even loved myself. And when I had none of the reality of my potential, right, he loved me and ultimately that potential came to be. Listen to what Paul will write to a young pastor named Timothy. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. How often do we just write off somebody because of their age? How often in our arrogance? Listen, God is all-knowing, and he invites us to talk to him. If that does not set a humble tone for how we treat people who are younger than us, then I don't know what it does. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example. So it's not just to not look down on them, but it is an encouragement. What is the encouragement? Set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. My friends, the next generation at the core, the foundation is we, they need us to pray for them and to believe in them.
I uh, heard an illustration of this. It's not necessarily about parenting. It's actually about all kinds of relationship. But what, what if you and I walked around our world and our lives, and as we come in contact with various uh, people, and in this particular case, the next generation, what if you walked around like you had Legos in your pocket? Any, any, any big Lego fans? Any big Lego fans? Yeah. How, how many of you guys are more of the um, I follow the direction Lego people? Like you're direction Lego people? Okay. How many of you are like, I am the chaos Lego people? Give me a, <laughs> like, I respect it. Respect it. I'm not an instruction guy. I'm not. Never have been. Never will be. Ikea, I hate you. So <laughs> watch. But wa- if, you, if you just walked around, you just walk, and you just walked around like you had Legos in your pocket, each one of those Legos represented value. You interacted with somebody at the store. You wanted to add value. You, wanted, you, you, you start coaching a baseball team. Maybe you're just the assistant coach. You don't even know that much about baseball. And let me just say this about our city. A lot of you are in here. Uh, we got a little league just around the corner from here, and I, I'm coaching T-ball. It's not my sport, okay? I don't even know why I'm doing it, but I'm going to do it, okay? I'm going to do it. And I stood around these 35 guys and one female that are going to say, we're going to invest in the next generation. Some of those people out there, I got to uh, talk with a couple of them. They don't have kids, They just want to invest in the next generation. What if, if you're a coach, if you're at the grocery store, wherever you're going, what if you treat it like you just had Legos and you're just going to add value? Every time you come and you see somebody, you engage with somebody, you're going to to show them whatever God gives you in that moment. He gives you 30 seconds, you're going to give 30 seconds of value. You're going to speak to that person with dignity and respect. You're going to treat them with with right you're going to look them in the eyes. You're going to ask them their name. You're going to, you're going to actually you're going to care about. You don't care about what they vote. You care about the, how they vote. You care about who they are. You don't care about what, what, what necessarily what their race is. You care about who they are, made in the image of God. That God spent time on them, uniquely fashioned them in his design. They are an image bearer of God. And as a result, every time you engage somebody, you realize, I've got an opportunity to add value. And every time you come across somebody, you just keep pulling pockets out of your pocket to add value. You're like, how, many, how many does he have? I'm going, to, I'm going to the ceiling, my friend. It's deep pockets. Just, th- just think about that. Every encounter, every engagement, you're really concerned with how many Legos I have, aren't you? You're like, did he customize Legos just for this illustration? Maybe. And you just keep coming across, and watch this. This is the next generation. You see what's happening? We're slowly building. You're like, I don't don't know what my role is. Just add value. Just treat them with dignity. Just treat them with respect. Know that they are the Imago Dei. Know that you were once an enemy of God. Know that, know that when you speak with respect and love, you are a witness. You are a witness. Even when you can't understand what's happening. Even you don't fully understand why, why their, their head is so close to their phone. You're going to seek... This is the last Lego I have. I'm so sorry. I'm out. You're going to seek to add value. Boom. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if the Christians in Vista, California, Oceanside, California, Carlsbad, California, Escondido, and every other city in North County, San Diego County, if we would start to see the next generation as people we can add value to, I believe we would make a massive statement to the rest of the world. That we believe God's not done. We believe that God will be faithful to what he promised. That we believe that he's raising up young men and women to carry the torch of the faith that has been entrusted to us and will be entrusted to them. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Do you know what I respect about Paul? What I respect about Paul is he set an example in speech. He set an example in conduct. He set an example in love. He set an example in faith 
and he set an example in purity. You may be asking, what, what do I do if I have a young person in my life? How can I invest in them? What does it look like to add value beyond the grocery store? What if God's brought somebody in my life, a, a, a student or a, or a, a, a player because I'm a coach or maybe you're a parent. You go, what can I do? What is a practical next step? Can I just tell you something? When they get to 18, okay, there's a massive gap between living with your parents and not living with your parents, right? How many of you guys know how big that gap is? No, you think it's tiny? <laughs> Good luck. Wait till you get there. Text me. Okay? It's a massive gap. Here's what you can do. Shrink the gap. Shrink the gap. In love, shrink the gap. In, in rubbing shoulders with them and teaching them about something very practical, shrink the gap. Right? In believing in them, shrink the gap. In holding them accountable, shrink the gap. You didn't like that one, did you, students? In everything you do, shrink the gap. Add value, shrink the gap. Give them, watch this. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. What is the next responsibility you can give them? What's the next responsibility you can give them? Right, wherever they are. And each kid is different. You, you, may be, you may be overwhelmed right now with where your kid is at. You may be overwhelmed with where your niece or nephew is at. You may be overwhelmed with where that kid on your baseball team is at. But here's, here's, here's what I know is they are somewhere. It's deep, isn't it? Wherever they are. Give them the next responsibility they can handle. This may be different in your home than the next home. You don't need to compare. You don't. In fact, the, Bi the, the Bible tells you not to. And so you can just evaluate the kid you have, and you can say, what is the next responsibility I can give them? Hey, let me give you a couple examples. I, we, we, by the way, we have some of the best parents in this church. Unbelievable parents. I learn from people in this place all the time. There's a family in our church that their kids, about six, seven, they start to do their own laundry. That's their thing. That's their thing. Now all their kids, they have four kids, three of their four kids, right, currently do their own laundry. That's more than I do. <laughs> Only guys laughed at that joke. Women are disgusted with me. Okay, here's, here's another one. Here's another one. We, we've got a family in our church. Their college-age kid lives with them. They charge them $300 rent. <laughs> Have you looked at the rental market, by the way, over here? 300 Other people are like, oh, my gosh, that's so cheap. He's like, whoa. Here's the deal. And, and, and the, the, this, the kid, when the, this first got brought up, they're like, but you're my parents. Yeah. I'm going to give you the next responsibility, the next one. Because when you move out, it's not 300, it's 3,000. Like, what do I get, a mansion? Nope. You get a shack in Escondido, right? <laughs> Seriously, you get a little playhouse. That's 1,500 bucks, right? I'm going to rent my little playhouse out in the backyard, 1,500 bucks. Plumbing? Nope, no matter. It doesn't matter. 1,500 bucks. Let's go. Craigslist it. Here, here's another one. This one's a little bit more extreme, a little bit more intense. This is why, look, context, I'm sharing one that's very similar to what I just shared. There's another family in our church. They're charging their, their kid, their adult child, full market value for their room. That's not fair. It's not fair. But they'll be ready. They'll be ready. Now, they're saving that money, and they're going to help him when he moves out. But don't tell the kid. <laughs> See what I'm saying? What is the next response? You got a young kid. What's the next responsibility? They can clean up their toys. Let them clean up their toys. Okay? They got that down? <laughs> Never, but <laughs> we move on. They got that? What's the next responsibility? What's the next responsibility? They can help you cook. They help you do the dishes. They can help. They want a dog? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
right? You want a dog? Now, I can't speak to this one because I'm still trying to get my kids to walk the dog, but, um, and I just got one. But that's the truth. That's the challenge of parenting, isn't it? It's the challenges in the exhausting pace of our lives when you have to go this place and that place, right? When, when you got school and you're trying to build a relationship and, and you got hormones and there's all these things happening, the question is, how do I have a laser-like focus? And I would just say, constantly ask yourself the question, where is the kid and what's the next responsibility you can give them? And, and you may miss on this. You may miss on this, and that's okay. You may try something, and it doesn't work. You know how many times my, mo- my mom put a chore chart up on the fridge? I started laughing, like, by, like, the seventh time. I'm like, what? You're gonna, you hate the way I do dishes. You want me to do the dishes? I'll do them once. I'll stink at it on purpose, then you'll take them back. I already know this drill. <laughs> and so what does that mean? That means that you have to be diligent. You have to be focused. You, need to, you probably need to pray at some point for God to give you the, 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 the desire to follow through on that. Because I'm telling you, one of the worst things you can do is give a responsibility and pull it back because they didn't do the way you wanted it. Let me ask you the question. What's more important, that it gets done the right way or that you raise up the next generation? What's more important? You get 18 years at this, friends. 18 years. It's okay if the dishes are a little dirty. It's okay if they're not stacked the way that you want them to. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, listen, I know it's hard. I know it's hard, especially your single parent in the room. Listen, you are the heroes in this room right now. You're heroes. Don't give up. Don't give up. You got the most important job in the world. And you don't get the respect you deserve. Don't give up. It matters. And they need our help, friends. They need our help. Number six. Oh, let me, let me talk about this for a second. Let me talk about this. Actually, uh, the slide in the very beginning of my message that I skipped, can we do that one real quick, and then we'll do the other one that looks like it right behind it, okay? First, and let, me, let me give you uh, some context to this conversation, and we should have started the sermon with this. Come to the second one if you want to see it the right way. Um, <laughs> the list of generations, okay? So th- this helps you to understand the framework of each generation, okay? So this is just a broad stroke. You can see Generation Alpha. They're, they're actually not in the room. Anybody born in 2013? I think sixth graders only would be in that. No, no, no. No, that would be like third graders. Sorry, my math's terrible. Here we go. Generation Alpha, okay? Generation Z. Generation Z, raise your hand if you're in the room. Raise your hand. Yes. Never been a day in their life where, where their parents and adults around them did not have a phone in their hands. That's, is that going to radically shape how they view the world? Yes. Okay? Is it their fault? Did they, did, when, when they were in the womb, did God hand them a scantron? They're like, I want to be born in a generation where there's phones. Did they choose that? Did they get to choose their country? No, they didn't. Okay, so you can, we can form views on them. But remember, when we take a broad view and we personalize it, we stop believing in an individual born in a generation that wasn't their choice. And there's unique challenges with every generation. Every generation has their own unique challenges. Generation Z, millennials, I reluctantly, I reluctantly am part of this group, 1985 for me, millennials in the room, raise your hand, millennials in your room, it's kind of confusing for us, right, right, because we we started with dial up, can you you hang out this weekend, I don't know, let me find out if my dial up will get there, AIM, remember AIM? Woo! I got pickup lines on AIM for days. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Millennials, there was a transition period. So, so it's, it's your part used to it, you know, but you also had that season of your life where, where it wasn't as dominant in the culture. You got Gen X. Raise your hand for Gen X. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Look at Gen X. Gen X doesn't get enough attention. So. <laughs> Just kidding. Gen X, right? So, so, so when did you get your first cell phone? What age? 30? Somebody say 30? Can, okay, hold on for a second. Let's just pause. What if you got your first cell phone at 30? You guys good with that? Perfect. 30. 30. All right. By the way, Gen X, I love 
you guys are you guys are the best. I wish it was a party. I'm sad. Okay, uh, Boomer. Woo, woo. Generation Alpha. Here we go. So, Boomers. Boomers. 1946 to 1964. I put there's supposedly a Boomer one and a Boomer two generation. I put them together. Raise your hand if you're a Boomer in the room. Boomers. Boomers. Yes. Okay, Boomer. Right. Here we go. We. Uh, first time you got your first phone you got, well, how old were you? Do you remember? He's like, I still don't have a cell phone. <laughs> Pulls out just this massive brick. You're like, where is that from? Remember like Zach Morris phone? Remember that? And of course, what is commonly known as the greatest generation, post-war generation. Can we give it up for them? Each generation has their own unique challenges. They're, they're, they're facing different things. They grew up with different realities. We, we have to work together. We're in this together, okay? Not, no generation had it figured out. All generation figures out sin, that's for sure. And it shows up and looks differently in different generations. And I'm here to tell you that, right, we have a responsibility. What is that responsibility? It's to raise caring, responsible wise humans. That's our responsibility to the next generation. Number one, we can give them the responsibility that they can handle next. Ne- number, si- number six on your note sheet is don't rescue them from failure. Do not rescue them from failure. Is there exceptions to this? Yes. The freeway would be one of them. Right? The, the street... A busy street would be one of them. That's not like a time to have a principled lesson, right? When a car is going by fast. There are exceptions to this. But listen, they're in the state, Paris for a second, just listen. I, I know you love them, and I know you don't want them to hurt. And I, know, I, and I hate, I hate when my kids are hurt. Hate it so much. But I'm, I'm just telling you, do you want them to learn failure in the confines and the safety of your home? Or do you want them to have no experience with how to cope, no experience with how to deal with that, and then go into the real world and without your safety, without your protection, without the the physical boundaries of your home, do you want them to fail for the first time there? The answer is absolutely, completely no. No. So much so that should you stand up for your kids? Yes, you should stand up for your kids. But you should also, at times, step back and ask yourself the question, is this this a moment in time where maybe, just maybe, I should let this play out with the teacher the way that they, the way that they are ready for? I'm just going to stay out of this one. They failed the test. I feel like that's not right. And you maybe even feel like, hey, but but you're just going to let it play out the way it plays out. Because maybe more important than the grade is the life lesson they can learn. By standing up for themselves, by treating that teacher with respect, by coming at it with as an adult. Because you know why? They're going to have a supervisor. And you know what you can't do? Bring your mommy to your annual review. (laughs) Do it. I dare you. (laughs) Next time you get a chance, be like, hey, boss, can, can my mom come? And then immediately apply for a new job. This is real. This is, this, I've heard stories of this happening. And so, w- w- listen, there are exceptions to this principle, but by and large, we try to rescue too much. Do you know how many times I've heard on my kid's soccer team how often the ref stinks? Do you know how much, that, how much better that makes the kids as soccer players? Every game, the refs stink. Every game. Sometimes it's me yelling. I'm, I'm not, I'm just, I'm part of it. Every game, the refs stink. Every game. I'm not kidding. You know who's not getting better? The kids. They're not getting better. You know why? Because they walk out the field. They're, the reason we lost is not because I could have been in that position. It's not because I could have made that pass. It's not, it's because the refs, somebody else's fault. And then we wonder why we have a victim blame culture. Guys, it's, it's the intention is right. The application is all wrong. Are there exceptions to this? Yes. Yes. 
How can you, how can we set a different example than the rest of the world? We hold our kids accountable, but they know we love them. We, we give our kids responsibilities they can handle, and we walk alongside them. We invest time and energy in them because we have a short window, and it's the most important job on the planet. And the people on the fringes who are Christians, they step in when they can. They, 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 they're looking for opportunities to add value to the next generation. They're partnering with parents. They're speaking languages that are helpful and not hurtful. They're, they're, they're not critical, right? They, they're invested. That's how, that's how we raise the next generation. We can't steal lessons from them. We can't rescue them from every failure. Listen to this. Football has a hell week. Military has a week. <laughs> Boot camp. All right, I'm just going to fill in. I'm not going to. Y'all are thinking about the Super Bowl at this point. Football has a hell week. Military has a boot camp. Marriage has premarital counseling. Premarital counseling. And kids have parents. Kids have parents. And that means that's our responsibility before they hit 18 to prepare them to the best of our ability. Each kid different, each generation different, responsibility the same. 18 years, 18 years. If you rescue them from failure and the safety of your home, how are they going to respond to failure in a world that doesn't love them like you do? You love them. The world does not. The world, the world ultimately is looking out for itself. You are looking out for them. Let them feel all of the things that the world has to offer them in the safety of your own home. I think it's time to shift perspective. And we need each other's support in the middle of it. I want to show you one last thing. I'm way over. So here, one last thing. Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, put up adult adolescence. Have you guys ever heard this term? Adult adolescence. Not adolescence. Adult adolescence. It's the age period after 18 where a legal adult is living without the maturity and responsibility of an actual adult. Adult adolescence. Your sweet 22-year-old that plays 40 hours of Call of Duty in your house, you're not helping him. You're not helping him. That girl that's living with you that you love that talks, talks disrespectfully to you over and over and over again, and she just keeps to keep doing it even though she dropped out of college and it's still you're not helping her. And listen, part of this is because of the cost of living, right? Some of it's practical. I get that, but I'm saying I'm saying that this is a result of the right intentions, the wrong application. I know why you, people do this. I do. I know why people do it, but it doesn't work. It just doesn't. And we need to be more diligent. This is the most important job all of us have, regardless of what role you play. Now let me for a moment talk to the students, and I'll close with this. Students, let me just tell you this. Freedom and responsibility, they go together. I know you want freedom. Just know that comes with what? What is responsibility? It's your ability to respond to the moment to the task, to the job. It's your ability to follow through, right? It's real, you started that sport, you don't really like it. You may have to finish that year because ultimately sometimes you start things you don't like and finishing something you don't like may be the most important lesson you learn. Freedom and responsibility go together. The more freedom you want, the more responsibility comes with it. You want keys to a car, you could kill somebody with that. You want keys to a car, somebody could kill you with that. Make sure that the responsibility that comes with that freedom is something that you have considered. Your parents love you. The people around you love you, and they want what's best for you. That is why they're trying to raise you in this way. Freedom and responsibility go together. One other lesson for you to fill in, and then I'll close. Honor and humility will take you further in life. James, the brother of Jesus, will write this in James 4.10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he and he will lift you you up. Verse after verse after verse talks about how you guys can be an example 
to, the, to people around you. One of those ways is your posture, humility. Another one of those ways is your work ethic. Another one of those ways is ultimately how you treat one another with empathy and respect and love and care, just like God did for you. And here's, here's what you do. When you commit your plans to the Lord, here's another verse, right? He will see you through. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Whatever you're pursuing, commit to him. Wherever you're going after, commit to him. He's got you. He sees what you don't see. He knows what you don't know. And he's pursued you and loved you and died on the cross to be connected to you every step of the way in your journey to life. Your trust in him is greater than the circumstances you face. So two thoughts. One, freedom and responsibility go together. Number two, honor and humility will take you further in life. I want to close today. You're going to cheer for a bunch of people you don't know. So can we just right now right? Because we love the next generation. Can we just give it up? We believe in you guys. We, we, commit, we commit to praying for you. We commit to believing in you. And we commit, we commit, right, to loving you and ultimately giving you the next responsibility you can handle so that you'll be ready for everything this world has for you. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your wisdoms all throughout Scripture. There's verses all over the place on this thing. I scratched the surface of the wisdom you gave for what it means to raise the next generation. We say thank you for caring, for loving, for showing us the example of Jesus and the disciples, for showing us the example of the disciples in the church, for showing us the examples in Scripture of good parents that love their kids. Thank you. These are the examples we need. We need each other, every single one of us. We are a village raising the next generation together. We thank you for the roles that you've, that you've given us. We take those as stewardships in our lives, and we ask for your help and guidance along the way. Spirit of God, lead us as we lead the next generation in a culture that is shifting. We love you. Thanks for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.